We bring you a special to a very special man. Tony Wilson is probably the most remarkable talent ever to work in these studios. For 30 years, he fronted more programs than anyone else, presenting them with a panache and a flair which had never been seen before. It was never dull when Tony was around. But that was only the tip of the iceberg. Five years ago, they made a film about him called 24 Hour Party People. To mark the occasion, Granada commissioned a documentary. In it, Tony and others talked about his life. Tonight, we update that programme. We look back at a complete one-off, an extraordinary man who meant so many different things to so many different people. Good evening and welcome to the news from ITV Granada. First tonight, broadcaster and music producer Anthony Wilson has died aged 57. Having battled kidney cancer, he passed away at Manchester's Christie Hospital earlier this evening with his family at his bedside. When the news broke that Tony Wilson had died of cancer at the age of 57, the reaction was phenomenal. The national and international media devoted huge amounts of airtime and column inches to a man who was essentially a regional personality. At his funeral ten days later, it all happened again. In the full media glare, friends from the world of music and television turned up to pay their last respects. Tony Wilson had a profound effect on all of them. An astonishing man. An amazing man, a total and utter one-off. Everything I've got in my wonderful life right now, I owe to my old man and my other old man, Tony. Infuriating, arrogant, brilliant, a friend, uh, generous, kind-hearted. He's, he's so many contradictions, and that's why he's a great person. Always provocative, Tony constantly divided opinion, inspiring love or anger wherever he went. He somehow managed to combine being the most famous face on local television with another life, one which would change popular culture. He also helped reshape Manchester, fought for Northwest political independence and had an acclaimed movie made about his life, as he might say not bad for a lad from Salford. Anthony Howard Wilson was born on February the 20th, 1950. An only child, his parents were shopkeepers, only a jeweler's and a newsagent's on Regent Road. His early years were spent in Marple in Cheshire, but at the age of 11 he passed a scholarship which took him back to Salford to De La Salle Catholic Grammar School. I was very surprised to find on the first day that I was in the A-stream, and incredibly surprised to find at the Christmas exams I was top of the class. And suddenly I found out, 11 years old, oh my God, I'm clever, which is an awful thing to find out and makes me is one of the nasty things, I suppose. It makes you kind of, that's what you shore up against the world. Doesn't matter if you're richer than me, you're whatever, I'm clever, my brain works. He won a place at Jesus College, Cambridge, where he demonstrated a passion for politics before graduating in English in 1971. He broke into television journalism at ITN in London, but in 1973 got a job as a reporter back home at Granada. Since the first caveman first watched the first prehistoric bird fly and wing his way across the skies. Man has wanted to get up there in the clouds. The fence, the barbed wire fence. Ah! He always referred to me as Mr. Greaves, which I at first thought he was taking the Michael, but then others at the time and later and at his funeral reminded me that it was a term of respect and admiration. And others said to me, and of love. We were a strange duo. I wouldn't have missed any of it for the world. <coughs> Tony was always on hand when there were music stories to cover and there were plenty of opportunities. And you know that audience want you to do the old Beatles stuff. And I know you do one or two, but yeah. how do you feel? Do you feel a conflict with what the audience wants and what you want? 
No, I don't think it's true that, you know, I think you'll find that kind of the older people in the audience want to hear that and for them we put it in. There was an arts roundup show called What's On. I put in a letter saying, excuse me, I'm very into film, very into music, could I do it next season? And they went, yeah. We just went nuts for about two years and the show grew to a 15 minute. it was eccentric, very wacky, very anarchic and great television. And that gave rise to the So It Goes series. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to So It Goes, a or perhaps the new music show. He was always the first one in the office to bring you the new Steely Dan album. You'll find us in the record racks under Literate Rock Show, which gives you some idea of our tensions, our intentions and our pretensions. And he was involved right from the beginning in working out what the show was, whatever it, whatever it turned out to be. Um, uh, he was a natural choice. Dirty, controversial, vulgar. His supporting cast was impressive. The regular comic contributors were Peter Cook and Clive James. Meanwhile, Farron Charles Flood Shah of Soundsmaker Express claimed that So It Goes was the kind of show the rock world had been waiting for, but it was crippled by the fact that Tony Wilson lacked the eloquence of Bob Harris, the seriousness of Tony Blackburn, the dignity of Jimmy Savile, and the brilliance of himself, Farron Charles Flood Shah. To me, it seemed kind of wild that this guy who, 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 was, on, who was a talking head on television had the pistols and, you know, the buzzcocks and people like that, and I thought it was fantastic. Do you think he had the Sex Pistols playing here in Granada before they even had a record deal, before they were ever on television anywhere else? It's absolutely amazing. It's like one of the most, you know, one of the most important cultural th things in pop culture ever, and it was here, and Tony did it. Sex Pistols, you can hear them warming up in the background even now. I would never would have booked the Sex Pistols if Tony Wilson had not told me about them. I was not a man who was out there at midnight being spat on in dark halls like he was. And he said, we should put these people on the show. Um, they're really extraordinary, which indeed they were. Um, and because Tony, you know, was enthusiastic and we trusted his taste, because he was, you know, out there listening to music, we said, OK, right, let's book him. Let's book him. It'll be fine. No problems. Suddenly, I was connected. I kind of, you know, Elvis Costello would say, hello to me and Malcolm McLaren would give me a t-shirt and I would talk to these people so suddenly this this far away wonderful world I was connected to. Wilson then teamed up with a close friend Alan Erasmus from a flat in Didsbury they started their own company Factory Records it soon became the most talked about record label in Britain thanks in particular to a band called Joy Division our claim to fame as a group was that, that we, were, we were working with Tony Wilson. My mother was very impressed. And uh, I must admit that one of the most exciting times that Tony did manage to pull off for us was when we got to do Shadow Play, when we were very young, on uh, Granada. I mean, Tony has this wonderful thing, this amazing thing in life that he can do some horrible things to you. <laughs> and then he can do some wonderful things to you. So it all balances out, quite luckily. When Joy Division evolved into New Order, they became global. But Wilson was still on the lookout for new talent. He approached an unlikely group of misfits from his hometown of Salford. I remember him saying to me, you know, and he wasn't even on the record company sniffing round, sniffing round them on this, but he, he said to me, Paul, if you come with Factory, you might not make any money, but I guarantee you, you'll, you'll get to see the world. You know, and at that time, it was like, that'll do for me. The next factory venture was a nightclub, the Hacienda in Whitworth Street. After years of struggle, the venue eventually became the spiritual home of the new music phenomenon Acid House. Manchester was the centre of the pop universe. The major person in the running of the Hacienda in the way it was you know, looked after was, was Rob, Rob Gretton. Tony was like your, your figurehead, you know, he'd sashay in and sashay out. And, yes, do it, darlings, do it, yes, as Trotsky once said. You know, all that crap. And the idea of the New York-style massive discotheque in 1981, so that in 1988, when Chicago, Detroit music, house music, blurs with Ibiza ecstasy culture will have the space to do it in. 
It's like, no, we just built this stupid bloody club and then things happen. But disaster wasn't far away. The hacienda was soon in the grip of drug dealers and armed gangs, and Factory also made the crucial mistake of moving into swish city centre offices. In 1991, Wilson's legendary lack of business acumen led to his biggest fall. I think the bankruptcy came very quickly, as they always do, and I don't think he had any control in it. I mean, he tried to rescue, which he did try and rescue Factory. He tried to sign it to Sony, to whoever had, you know, be interested in buying it. But the problem was he didn't have any contracts with the band, so he had nothing to sell. On the day of the, uh, of the, the collapse, uh, I think Tosh Ryan said to Wilson, well, who won? <laughs> Who won, Tony? And Wilson said, well, the music won. I must have been about 12 or 13, and I get this call from Dad, and I'd not heard from him however long. He's like, darling, it's Tony Wilson, it's your father. Listen, it's in the papers. Don't worry, darling, everything will be fine. All right, got to go. Put the phone down, then got home that night, and on the front of the paper, Mr Manchester goes bankrupt, and that's kind of an idea of maybe what it was like to have him as a dad. The doors might have closed on factory, but Tony Wilson wasn't about to go away. Good evening, music, poetry, wisdom, the key to the universe, even all in tonight's What's In. Throughout his musical adventures, Tony Wilson had still been doing the day job at Granada. He'd had a brief flirtation with the network when he fronted World in Action, but it was in regional TV where he flourished. This is the news in the Northwest with Richard. Thank you, Tony. Usually, as the opening titles of Granada Report's role, Tony would surge in, doing up his shirt buttons, putting his, his tie straight, sit down, and be Mr. Perfection. I mean, be absolutely faultless. He would calm you down, he would make you laugh, um, you know, he brought good things around with him. When he came into the office, when he came into the studio, everybody kind of brightened up, perked up mm. and uh, really enjoyed being there with him. Can you imagine that? His versatility was extraordinary, his enthusiasm undimmed, and always one to provoke the audience, he suddenly started calling himself Anthony. H. Wilson. Anarchists don't change the name to Anthony H. Wilson, do they? I mean, come on. His, his pomposity never ceases to amaze me, but I just, I've just lived with it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jockey H. Wilson. 180, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you think that's funny, don't you? Yeah. Live from the Granada Studios Tour Theatre, it's Granada up front. Tony and I worked together in the bear pit that was up front, and I'm grateful he helped steer me through it. He constantly offered support and reassurance, things he clearly didn't need. He loved it. Mr. Ben, no, 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 I'll speak now, Mr. Ben. You've, you've done your talk. I I'll speak now, Mr. Ben. The people of Britain actually regard the poll tax as more important to them than your constitutional oh, issue. I love live television. There is nothing like live television. Fantastic. So that was live, being a ringmaster, and also the intellectual challenge. That kind of, the, the fact that your brain is whirring, keeping the pattern of the narrative in place and moving it. So, yes. Probably was made for me. I loved it. I'd love to do it again. You're the back, sir. You. Go on. Wait till you get the mic on you and be quiet, please, in the box. You, sir. But one night, even he was taken by surprise. He doesn't say anything. He's brought that wimp with him. At least he doesn't even look the part. It's showbiz. Sit down, boys. For once, he'd been stopped in his tracks, but he simply dusted himself down and got on with it. If his screen life was busy, his personal life was complicated. He had two failed marriages, but was enormously proud of his two children, Isabel and Oliver. Not surprisingly, he was no ordinary father. He wasn't a dad in the traditional sense. My dad used to take me in the Hacienda when I was a young kid, when it was all, you know, kicking off with the acid house thing. And I remember going in there and, you know, I've got visions now, I can remember it so clearly, of going in the house and it going crazy 
and these people dancing like idiots and people coming up and hugging me and everybody was smiling and it was a very nice atmosphere and I never understood. I used to ask my dad, what are they doing? His partner for the last 17 years was Yvette Livesey, a former Miss UK from Lancashire. In 1992, they set up In The City, a music business convention which still thrives. I find with most intellectuals or most clever people that emotionally they are terribly underdeveloped. And that's why I say about Tony being almost the worst person in the world to be famous because he so hasn't had to work on his personal side and personal development. And he's just so not interested. As the 21st century dawned, he continued to make TV programs and to win awards were always accepted with good grace. So there was Tony saying, thank you for my Lifetime Achievement Award, and then suddenly he goes into this total slagging off of the guest speaker that night, calls him for everything under the sun. In all these years, for me, my professional colleagues, and my region, you've never done a f thing. <laughs> Those that didn't know Tony were probably absolutely... Uh, disgusted and affronted that he should do that to the guest and all of us who knew Tony just thought that's Tony it wouldn't be the same without him and just loved it. I'm Tony Wilson here we are as we are so it goes on tonight's show I'll be talking to Alice Cooper live at the Apollo apparently he'll be hanging a dwarf live on stage. Then came the ultimate accolade a feature film based on his life story with Steve Coogan in the starring role. He has a very specific way of speaking, he has a very physical way of talking. His, his gestures, his hand movements are all part and parcel of being Tony Wilson. I'm not a lump of hash. I'm in charge of Fancy Records. I was shocked, a bit surprised. Um, I think in equal parts flattered and embarrassed. It was upsetting for me because it depicted a lot of things in my life and a lot of things about my father, some of which were true, some of which were not, but still touching on very personal issues. I can't watch it now. I can't watch it now. I don't like watching it. How many people at the murder of Julius Caesar? No, Tom, you tell me. Five. So shut up then. Around the same time, we were delighted to welcome him back to Granada Reports, where he showed he'd lost none of the mischief which so captivated audiences 30 years earlier. It's one of those jokes that we don't like to make because we leave the bad puns to the man called Burns and the BBC. A four-letter word uttered off camera, but unfortunately not off mic, meant that that return was short-lived. His last series for Granada was one he'd wanted to make for 20 years, a celebration of his beloved Northwest and its place in global history via the Industrial Revolution. And it happened right here in Lancashire, England's Northwest. The dramatic changes of those times shaped the region we now live in as well as the world that everyone lives in. There you are, you see. You probably thought your home was the centre of the universe. Turns out you were right. Tony's love for Manchester, not least Manchester United, was acknowledged by all. We absolutely knew everything about the club. You know, that, that clarity of, of knowledge was... Uh, I think it was part of his job. I think he had a great grammar, great diction. I thought these were his great qualities. When I see him in television, I say, there's a man who knows what he's talking about. Tony made uh, a real contribution to taking Manchester back to what it once was, this creative hub, this uh, uh, remarkable international city, this remarkable city with attitude, and there is nobody, I think, uh, uh, better than Tony to have represented that, uh, that, that mank attitude. He mischievously cultivated a love-hate relationship with Liverpool, but he had a genuine affection for that city too, and indeed the whole of the North West. First of all, Mike, I know that Liz Bateman's story is a singular... During the last few years, he'd been working for the BBC, presenting a regional political programme as well as hosting his own radio show. But early in 2007, he shocked us all when he revealed he had kidney cancer. Suddenly, I'm dying of cancer. Everyone loves you. If you ever worry about people hating you, just get cancer. It's fantastic. People are so concerned. So now everyone loves me. It's like, oh, Toe, are you all right? Are you all right? I'm going, yeah, f off. It's like, yes, I'm fine, thank you. He kept going. He went, you know, it, one of the things that really did his health in was going to New York two months before he died. He shouldn't have done that trip. 
but he wanted to do it. And he did it. And he went to Los Angeles as well, but even before then, I'm forgetting, we went there. And um, he was never going to stop. You're never going to stop him. It soon became apparent that a cancer drug which might have added years to his life wasn't available to him on the NHS. Friends he'd helped make rich and famous rallied round to pay the three and a half thousand pound monthly bill. Tony, angry that the drug wasn't freely available to all, threw himself into the campaign to publicise what he believed was a national scandal. For other people whose lives are much more damaged because they don't have any way of, way of paying for it, for those people, I feel profoundly sorry. I think there are people being seriously, seriously m m maltreated by the NHS who are not given this drug and not having it paid for. I was amazed, actually, at his energy levels and his commitment to the campaign because I knew, really, he was at a point where he was very poorly and would probably have been happier sitting on the sofa getting over his illness. But, no, he got himself to TV studios got himself interviewed and really put it out there for us, which I thought was just amazing. But despite his concerns for others, he developed complications of his own. And a short time after this, his last appearance on Granada Television, Tony died in Manchester's Christie Hospital. A remarkable life was over. It was horrible watching him towards the end. It's kind of a weight off my shoulders in a way. Not in a horrible way, but... Uh... Yeah, relief, and uh, it's too soon. It's too soon to think about it, really, I think. A little bit more time to gather my thoughts. For Tony Wilson, not to be here at, at 57 with so much still to do, and still doing so much right up to the point of his death, it seems like some sort of celestial mistake's been made. His boots are like size 40 million, aren't they? Who's going to fill them boots? They're very, very big boots to fill um, for, for what he did musically, you know. And, and not just music, you know, it was, it, was, it was the whole package with Tony. Of all the special people I've worked with in these studios over 35 years, and there were a lot, he was the one with a capital T and a big capital O.